This is on Nomi, a great new idea out of Japan, online drinks with your friends when you can't be with them in person. Cheers. Hello everyone, it's Andy from Precision Hydration here, once again having a, an on Nomi, and today's online drink is with Kat Matthews. How are you Kat? Hi, Cheers. yeah. Cheers. What Hi, are you Andy. Drinking? What are you drinking this morning? It's fairly I, early this morning. Yeah, I'm on a quite a um, yeah, quite a weak coffee with some lactose-free milk. Oh, right. Sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> is that your is that your morning tipple of choice? It is at the moment. I'm I'm trying something new. I've had a few um, GI issues in racing recently, so I've changed things up a little bit, and I'm just experimenting. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so lactose is on the ban list at the moment. It's on the very low list. I'm not one of those yeah. people who's not going to turn anything down, you know. Ice cream's still on the list, but... Fair enough. I can see your logic there. Yeah, well, I'm going to do a horrible product placement plug now because we've got some lovely new... These have just oh. come in. So I'm drinking from a nice vacuum-walled stainless steel, mm. hot and cold, laser-etched precision hydration bottle, which I think That's is really fancy. cool. So, yeah we'll have to get one of those in the post to you pretty soon when we get the, the full shipment in um yeah so look out on the website they'll be up soon um yeah but we really want to be chatting to you about um about triathlon and you know it's obviously been a very funny year for for athletes all around the world you though seem to have managed to get in quite a bit of racing recently more than more than most so and things have been going pretty well i think so Tell us about your last few races. Yeah, I mean, the opportunity has been there for a lot of people. And I think there was a lot of um, racing opportunities virtually over the lockdown period. But um, seeing races in reality, I was pretty happy that I'd really committed to training over lockdown. So I was confident to say, yes, I am fit enough to go into some of these races. So I just took the opportunity with, that was there. Um, yeah, lockdown obviously was tough with the training, but... Going into Tallinn in early September, I couldn't have been more excited. Um, yeah. Really, really happy just to be out there. The admin of getting there with the um, testing protocols, it made you feel safe, but it was a real, it was a real stress. Yeah. Yeah, and you had a great result there, didn't you? Yeah. Um, took the win um, by, by a good few minutes, uh, which was quite reassuring. I know the competition was very high. Um, for those top few spots with some unknowns in there as well. So I didn't go into the race, um, you know, overly confident, but I was really excited to sort of show where my running was at because that's something that I've been sort of like working on, I guess, over the lockdown period. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, um, I noticed as well as doing the triathlons, you'd jumped in and taken part in the 100-mile British Time Trial Championships and you did rather well in that too. Yeah, I mean, to have um, a race in August was, you know, I, I didn't, I think everyone was under the assumption that triathlon just wouldn't be happening in 2020. So, you know, why not put yourself up for a time trial? It's obviously a little bit risky because you're going to get, probably going to get beaten by some Uber cyclists. Um, but actually, I think the triathletes in Britain really showed their strength. Um, you know, Ruth is out there as well. Um, and I know Kim Morrison was, was riding so well until a puncture. And so I think, that was a really nice race to be part of and actually sort of proved to like the country as well that us triathletes are better than, well, better at, or at least competitive with the best cyclists out there. Yeah, yeah. Because I was looking at the stats of your ride, it seemed that you, you rode under four hours, which is a huge milestone for anyone, you know, riding 100 miles because obviously uh, 25 mile per hour average, you, you cruised under that by five minutes average power output was 226 watts is that right something like that sounds, yeah, and, sounds right. and 174 beats per minute heart rate for nearly four hours average yeah people love the heart rate data um it's actually really normal for me uh, and the rest of my family and i and um as lots of you'll know on swift power there's quite a lot of data now on lots of yeah. people including heart rate and actually it's quite interesting to have a little peek at who's you know, in that upper category. And um, yeah. so, yeah, for me, that heart rate is very much like a sort of tempo heart rate um, for cycling. Even It's even a, 
you could say it's a bit low because I actually spent the first couple of hours um, quite easy. Um, and that was something that I'm really glad I did is that I built through the race. So I think I was way down in maybe fifth or sixth for the first hour and then just sort of kept building up. And it was a bit of a confidence boost because I really didn't know how it was going to go. I had no expectation of riding that fast. Yeah. Um, on a course like that, I think there was like, I don't know, there was over 10 sort of turnarounds and um, the country roads, it wasn't closed roads. There were so many things that were going to affect it. And so I wasn't really thinking necessarily about speed. I was just thinking about, I mean, in terms of overall speed, the main, the only thing I was thinking about was trying to make the aero in, as quick as possible through the whole thing rather than power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's good, good approach, it sounds like. It certainly worked for you on the day. Yeah, and just and I, just going back to just going back to that heart rate thing because people are interested in it, and I think it, and it's good to highlight that because when when I studied exercise physiology, um, you know, twenty years ago now, it was there was very much sort of you know the rule of thumb was obviously maximum heart rate is about two hundred and twenty beats minus your age, and that you know obviously fitter athletes can sustain a higher percentage of that maximum for a long period of time, but it would it would seem to me like your your maximum heart rate must be quite high if you can hold 174 for four hours have you seen do you regularly see numbers over 200 uh not regularly but it's not abnormal if i was doing a high intensity session especially running i think yeah. what again is slightly different uh, with me is that i seem to be able to get my bike heart rate up to very very close near my run heart rate yeah um, so, for example, the Army Sprint Champs um, a couple of days ago, yeah. um, it was just a half an hour bike race, but I was hitting over, I hit 190 a couple of times on one of the little hills. Um, so, yeah, my max heart rate do doesn't fit in that um, 220 minus my age in either bike or run. Um, and so, yeah, and I, ha I have always trained at quite high intensity, especially as a kid. So it's not really a shock to me. I'm, I'm really quite in tune with exactly where my sort of uh, thresholds are in terms of those turn points so I know that for example Zwift racing I know that I can sort of sit at 183 or something I'm probably giving yeah. too much nature away now if <laughs> anyone tries to race me on Zwift but as soon as I hit sort of 185 186 that's when I know I've only got x you know a few minutes or sort of 10 minutes or so of capacity left and I need to sort of tailor it appropriately so I really use that in my um middle distance racing and yeah I did, when i did the first i i did last year because i know that i can even if i'm feeling rubbish and i'm feeling like my legs you know it's not working i just have a quick check of my heart rate and it's actually low and i'm like come on then work a bit harder so yeah, yeah i really use that as a tool yeah use that to guide you do you do you find because i'm interested in this because when i when i was racing seriously i used heart rate a lot because power meters and things like that were only just coming in so they weren't you didn't have a lot of metrics to go on and i i used to definitely see a pattern where if it tended to be if i was racing well my heart rate was more responsive i could get it to move faster you know if i sped up on the bike or sped up running i would see a faster rise in heart rate and also it would go higher whereas when i was feeling a bit flat or off off the pace it would be reflected in the fact that my heart rate was like more sluggish and yeah. do, you, do you notice anything like that yeah definitely and those days when I don't feel as good I can look back and look at that data um or even in real time and I'm, I'm trying to work harder and yet I just can't get my heart rate up and that's definitely a sort of a fatigue thing and I think or the cold, because obviously I think a couple of us had that outlaw <laughs> last weekend, is that we just weren't able to get our heart rates up. You know, we weren't able to get yeah. going because you're so cold. But no, definitely with that sort of fatigue element, it's more in training that I see that. And I use yeah. that as a bit of a tool to say, OK, like, don't worry about the watts in this training session. Just focus on effort and RPE. And I'm quite happy to just sort of ignore that watt data for that day and accept that I am fatigued, which is quite nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a big part of um, it's a big part of being able to manage that overall training load, isn't it? And accept that not every day is a you can't have a great day every day. Yeah, yeah. Which is why swimming is so hard because you have to have a great day every day, otherwise you feel like you're you know you're rubbish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember chasing the the black line in the clock. It's oh. pretty merciless. It's at least with a run or a bike ride, you can go out and turn everything off and just go and enjoy the scenery or whatever. But swimming yeah. is always a bit a bit measurable, isn't it? 
Yeah, and that's something that I've definitely, that's a massive thing for me this year is that I really committed to those, um, you know, the zone two heart rate, you know, steady run, the steady runs, steady rides. I just got out on my bike and it's the first time I think that I've really just fully embraced riding. You know, now I just, I plan a route, a couple of hours, three, four hours, whatever it is, and I just go out and enjoy it. And I think that's new to me because um, I'm still, I, last year I was still sort of just learning how to to really, um, you know, ride for a long period of time. Yeah. yeah, is that is that a reflection of the fact that obviously you turned pro relatively recently and and you've now got more time to train, so you've changed your approach, you know, more high volume. Um, I mean, I definitely had the more time. I still had time last year to do it, um, but it's. I think it's just a development, you know, athlete development. I think. I think it's just time on the bike, and you just learn that if you can do two hours, you can do three hours. If you can do three hours, you can do six hours, and I think it's just that sort of just that progress um but yes I've definitely had a lot of time and over lockdown you know it's like why not go out for five hours or so on the bike you know there's there's nothing else to do um yeah. so you haven't got that oh, I've got to get back for this meeting or I've got to get back to do, go out with friends it's well I've, I'd, I'd rather be here cycling there's nothing else I'd rather do which is quite nice yeah yeah so it sounds like you've, you've definitely made the best of this this last few months that's for sure yeah i've tried <laughs> yeah what's what's next up race wise for you um so me and i think the rest of us um brit pros are targeting i'm on portugal so yeah. uh the list the entry list has just been released um although i've just noticed this morning that i think loads of the flights have been cancelled to and from portugal so um whether that goes ahead i don't know but it would be amazing to get an iron man in definitely and yeah. then i'm hoping that I get an invite to Challenge Daytona in December, but again, TBC. Yeah, that's a big one on a lot of people's list, I think, isn't it? This year, hoping to to end the year on a on a you know big a big race and a big high. Yeah, I mean, it just looks really quite cool. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds it sounds like it's really good. Um, another thing I wanted to to talk to you about is um, obviously you're a pro triathlete now, but you are you've been in the in the British Army for a number of years as a physiotherapist tell us a little bit about um you know your sort of route into that and what it's been like and and what you specifically I'm really interested in the fact that um obviously being in the military it's a very disciplined and sort of focused environment and has any of that training that you undertook with that influenced the way you approach you know your triathlon career yeah I mean definitely to the end of that question um so I joined the British Army six six years ago now um so I've been a physio before that qualified at university when I did my work experience as a kid I went to a military base to see physios working and so I applied to university thinking that I want to be a physio in the army it was never anything else Mm. and so I just kept pushing that route even though the that was quite it's quite a challenging process um with selection and just administration um and I got my first job at heavy court which was my absolute dream job so I was working with um a real mixture of sort of chronic rehab and some acute trauma which was amazing um and then did a couple of other jobs um and spent a few months out in Canada working with um the soldiers out there doing sort of realistic sort of mock-up of what would be a you know a ground-based um, military activity um, and that again was just really really insightful and I was just really lucky to be a part of it um, so many opportunities in the army it's amazing um, and then as I progressed through the sort of triathlon sport there was um, it was obvious to the sort of army side that I had a bit more potential than um Potent, you know I had the potential to go a bit further and to, and to target some of these world championships events so they have a really good system of where they sort of filter and select through the national governing body with your sport and um, so they get in contact with British triathlon and have a sort of realistic ha- what is the actual potential of this person rather than you know just them on social media saying that they're really good yeah, um, yeah. and so it's a really well sort of um yeah really really good structure of um progression and pathway that they have that you you can then have more time to do the sport and then at the very top end which is where i'm at at the moment is that my job role is now to train for triathlon full time um rather than to be a physio full time so um obviously it's a slight niche um but at the same time as um 
I'm able to basically fully commit to sport just as we've got um, Olympic skiers, we've got Nordic skiers, we've got biathletes, we've got bobslayers. Um, there's some guys doing modern pentathlon. Um, I think there's maybe a couple of cyclists as well. So it's a really broad spectrum and it's all to do with like sort of potential and then performance at the world at that international level. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into um, the sport as such with triathlon is because my first job was at Headley Court where they had a swimming pool and I sort of took the opportunity then to be like, well, I might as well. I had swum as a kid, um, but yeah. sort of start back up swimming. And so um, I really like, I genuinely fundamentally believe that like joining the army was what made me sort of transition to it and then has given me the push in the right direction to say actually like, you can do this bit more training. You can have this time to recover. Okay, let's see what you can do full time. Um, yeah. But in terms of how it's affected me as an athlete, in terms of the sort of training, um, I really think that there's an element of sort of the, the discipline with, like we talked about earlier, about if a session's not going so well, just having that confidence to say, actually, no, that's okay. I'm not going to just keep thrashing myself. I'm going to change it up slightly. Um, and then with racing, so I have started doing over the last, well, it's, I did it a little bit last year, but I've really invested in it this year because I've had more time, is like a really detailed plan of the race. So yeah. this involves my travel, my packing, um, the logistics of um, whereabouts, you know, the hotel is, where's the race, what I need to do. Um, and then it also goes into a detailed analysis of the race course itself. And I think what I learned from the 100-mile time trial was that if you know the course, which I had memorized the day before, if you know the course, you know the turns, you know where the hills are, you can really get the most out of it. And so I think that's something that I definitely used in Tallinn. Um, and I invested again in an outlaw is that I, I knew exactly where I was at all, all points of the course and when the hills were coming, the percentage of the gradient, how long I was going to have to push on them, um, just for that sort of that perspective. So I think that planning aspect and being able to manage that is definitely a useful tool that I've like taken from the military side. Yeah, no, it's interesting you say that because I, I look back at a lot of the best races that I I had as a, an athlete and they were often coincided, probably not surprisingly, with where I felt obviously the best physical preparation. But alongside that, I'd wrecked the course a lot of times. I'd, I'd got it in my head what gears I was going to use on the bike, depending on the wind and the the whatever was happening. I was I became like an obsessive. And I'm not I'm not a terribly organized person, but I'm not. People who know me well would, would definitely not put me in the category of being like uber organized. But for those races, I would be, I would be obsessed with lists. I would have lists of everything. Everything would get checked. You know, it would, and that was, I think, part of the way of, for me, it was part of the way of dealing with the nerves. You know, like it was a way to channel yeah. the energy and checklists. And like you say, working out, okay, well, where am I going to park or where am I going to stay and how am I going to get to the start and what am I going to, and getting all of that like nailed so that. I used to call it getting on the treadmill. So once that, that last couple of days started, you just kind of got on the treadmill and you knew what was going to happen. And it was going to, you know, yeah. you, you knew you had everything ticked off. And yeah, it's interesting you say that from, from a military perspective, because obviously planning and preparation and everything is what I presume you get, you get drilled into you at, at, um, in training. So yeah. Good. yeah, there's a, yeah I'm sure you've heard it before. There's a phrase that's called, um, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance or something yeah yeah there's loads <laughs> so, of variations yeah the um for the nerves thing it's massive so i i will wait until maybe you know the week before and i'll try and just sort of put it out of my mind and just focus on training and then that week before i'm like right i'm gonna sit down and have a nice little coffee because obviously you're tapering at that point so you've got less yeah. way less to do training wise and yeah and once i've written that out i'm just I'm just there. I'm like in the zone. I'm like, it's nothing else to stress about. I think it's before you write that I start stressing a little bit beforehand. But yeah, it's exactly. It's, I like that on the treadmill. That's cool. Yeah, we we talk about it now in in PH as a business because when certainly it's not been the case this year. But when we go and do international travel for for business, we're often doing a lot in a short space of time so johnny and myself will go over to the us for example or to australia and we'll have back-to-back -back meetings day after day different towns different states you know flights in between and that and we spend an inordinate amount of time planning that trip so that when you go you've just got like a printout basically or, yeah. or on your phone and you just know this is my flight number this is this i'm going to go from here to there i've got a car pre-booked i've got this hotel and the, and yeah, it's a great way to be when you've got to pack a lot in and when you've got to be 
on your game to perform. I'm a, I'm a big believer in it. I don't think you can live your whole life like that. Some people try to or can, and I think that's that takes a special type of person. I I need a little bit more freedom day to day. But when you've yeah. got to when you've got to perform, I think it's a great a great philosophy because it, it it always used to amaze me that I would see people, you know, turn up to races in the ah oh, they've forgotten a bike shoe or they've like you know they've picked up the wrong wetsuit or they've done you know and I always just think how could you possibly do that? But you know I think it's just a case of not not focusing on the minute details and. And if yeah. it catches you out, that can be, considering the, the amount of other effort that goes into getting ready, it can be really disappointing. Yeah. And especially with long distance triathlon, because obviously with the fueling and the hydration side of things, like you need to know where you're going to be picking up those water bottles, how you're going to, um, you know, how you're going to tailor your, your nutrition for that specific course. Are you going to pick anything else up? Like, you know, position hydration wise, like how many tabs do I need to take? Which tabs do I need to take for the race? You know, which ones do I need to pack? How am I going to carry it on the bike to then add it in? Yeah. Like I think writing all those things down, like going through the race means that you've got that list, you know, it's all packed and ready. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Checklists. Maybe we should put one up on our website. You could help us write it for people okay. to tick off before a race. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. I've got one more question for you, Kat, because I heard sure. something interesting, I think, on another podcast that you were talking on about working with a sports psychologist and talking about the, the sort of why is finding your why for racing and, and that kind of thing. And I thought that might be a nice thing to to sum up on is you know, tell tell us and tell people about what that means for you and, and why it's important yeah um so um a little bit of context um to add to that uh, uh, through the army they link you into a system with universities called tas the talented athlete scholarship um, scheme and with that package you have access if you want it to sports psychology and so i've seen um two different sports psychologists because i moved um like location in the, in the uk uh for a couple of sessions and the bigger picture of sort of the output from that was really generating my um like my why like why am I doing the sport um, especially when I'd had some really good success and then it was like well so what and I think that's what a lot of people get with that sort of post-race blues idea is it's like if something goes really well everyone expects you to be really happy and sort of push on and, and I had done some really good results but I wasn't necessarily as happy as I sort of expected to be yeah. um so yeah, was working through that. And for me, I think I've come to the sort of the bigger picture of just firstly, you know, that happiness is the aim of life. Um, and so if you're happy doing what you're doing, then you've already won, you know, you've won that day, you've won that year. Uh, and with triathlon specifically for me, I enjoy doing all of the training. I love the structure that it gives me. And I love feeling fit and healthy. Um, and the results are a bonus because it's like it's it's sort of um, showing that I'm that I'm, you know, succeeding. But it's not necessarily my my why. Um, but it's for me, it was about putting together some sort of morals about who I wanted to be as an athlete rather than my success. So focusing on, again, that sort of happiness and enjoyment factor rather than like the podium positions and so I came up with some sort of words that I wanted to really reflect who I was um, which is also tied into social media because I found it quite hard initially to sort of keep like plugging myself um, and so for me it was sort of like pride um, happiness um, you know, humility respect um, and then the idea of hopefully to inspire other people to be fit and healthy at whatever you know performance level so I know that I use the word proud, proud and pride quite a lot. And I think that's something that's been just so much part of my childhood um, that it's just ingrained in who I am. And the humility factor is definitely a sort of there's a, you know, a maybe a military link coming through there as well. But I think it's just important for me that I enjoy the sport. Um, and at the, if you enjoy it, then you sort of rub that off on everyone else and they can enjoy it. Um, so yeah, that was the sports psychology side. Yeah, no, it sounds it's, it's, it sounds great. You know, it sounds to me like a lot of people could take a lot away from that because although sport is for some people is about competition and winning and podiums and that kind of thing, and they are they are they define it to a degree. They can't be the be all and end all because even the very best people aren't 
on on getting there all the time and i think you're dead right i remember again looking back at my own training and things and being going through phases where it was just just the most enjoyable thing to do to be fit and active and like just you know feeling like you're performing brilliantly whether you had great races or not becomes secondary and that's yeah. kind of a good place to be yeah and then you never have those like I definitely I'm not one of those people who fear failure but I think that's quite a common thread in a lot of people and but for me it's more about fearing injury um mm. so I think if you can understand that it's not necessarily about it is obviously everything is about success like winning the world championships like there's got to be a you know there's got to be a goal but day to day if you're not constantly tipping on performance you then don't have that same anxiety and i think that that then is only a positive because anxiety as we know like the psychology of it is detrimental to sort of health so i think yeah it just allows you to have that sort of positive attitude throughout life even if you come across those bumps which are inevitable with injuries and and failures in races yeah and i guess i guess with injuries at least as well being a physio you've you can at least critique the standard of care and rehab you get if that does happen <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it it has its own challenges being a physio, definitely. But um, I've I've been actually quite proud of myself. I've like nursed myself for a for a proper calf injury um, during lockdown, and you know, um, a pretty bad wrist sprain. I had a little bike crash. So there's been some um, yeah injuries over lockdown that I've managed to like manage really well, and mm. that's something I haven't done in the past necessarily because I've just been too feisty to just sort of push through them and um, so yeah. yeah the physio background is is massive in me as an athlete in terms of like how i how i get through those niggles and try and treat them before they become a problem mm. yeah sage advice for sure i could <laughs> we, we should talk off air about calf injuries i'm a <laughs> expert in those for, for all the wrong reasons <laughs> the amount of them i've had over the years but no thank, thanks kat we you know l- love um supporting you as an athlete and um, being part of your journey so thanks for doing everything you do for precision hydration and um, wish you all the best for Portugal hopefully that and Daytona go ahead and um, yeah I, we just hope to see you up on that podium again before too long yeah brilliant thanks so much for your support Andy no worries thanks Kat bye-bye